Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 44, The Pequot Genocide. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. First, I have an announcement. I will be speaking at the Intelligent Speech online conference on the 27th of June, 2020. Tickets are $10, and they'll give you access not just to my talk, but to talks from the podcasters behind When Diplomacy Fails, The History of Ancient Greece, Pontifacts, The History of Byzantium, so many more. You can see a full list of speakers and the schedule over on intelligentspeechconference.com. That again is the 27th of June, 2020. Last week, we covered the raid on Mystic, where a combined force from Connecticut and Massachusetts colonies and the Narragansett and Mohegan nations surprised a Pequot settlement. When the Allies withdrew, they left in their wake a smouldering ruin, as well as hundreds of corpses of Pequot men, women and children. In this episode the final episode of this season of Pax Britannica, the Pequot would be utterly destroyed. Their leaders and soldiers dead, their civilians enslaved, and the Pequot name and culture forbidden to the survivors. Mason and Endicott's approach to the Pequot, that is, collective punishment and indiscriminate violence, was repeated for the rest of the war, with other commanders following this standard of warfare now established. As I've mentioned, Mystic tore the heart out of Pequot resistance. Whether or not they had, as Mason recounts, been preparing for an attack on the English, now they fought for survival. Sassacus led the Pequots west, abandoning their villages and seeking refuge with the Mohawks. They got as far as modern-day Fairfield, Connecticut, before Mason caught up with them in July. Mason was now at the head of 200 men a combination of English, Mohegan, and Narragansett, and joined once again by Uncas and Captain Israel Stoughton. The Pequots had found shelter with the local Sasquas people, but when the English and their allies arrived, they all fled into a nearby swamp. The English, in an eerie repeat of Mystic, surrounded the swamp. After firing a few volleys of shot into the reeds, a man named Thomas Stanton was sent in to negotiate, due to his knowledge of the language. After these negotiations, it was agreed that the almost 200 non-combatants, women, children, and elderly men, would surrender. They would later be enslaved and distributed among the Allies. The Sasquas were also allowed to leave. The remaining Pequot men, Sasquas amongst them, refused to surrender. They knew that, at best, they would be enslaved, though surrendering Pequot men were usually summarily executed. They would fight. Over the rest of the first day, the English whittled down the Pequot numbers, and on the second day, Sassacus managed to escape through the English lines, along with a small bodyguard. The remaining warriors were either killed or captured. Very few of the attackers were injured, and none were killed. Sassacus made it into Mohawk territory, though by now the news of the Pequot's destruction had reached them. The Mohawks tracked down the refugee Sachem and killed him and his retinue. They sent Sassacus's head to the English. He had not been worth risking English wrath. The Pequots were done. Over the following months, whenever Pequots were found, the men were killed and the women and children taken into slavery. Those so enslaved often found themselves on ships bound for the Caribbean, though many enslaved Pequots remained in New England to serve their conquerors. John Winthrop Sr. was among many in the colonial leadership to have Pequots in his household, as did Roger Williams. The Pequot War officially came to an end, with the signing of the Treaty of Hartford in September 1638. The Pequots were not represented. Instead, It was an agreement between the victors. The English colonies of Connecticut, the Narragansett, 
and the Mohegans. Roger Williams played a central role in this, and his letters between the various colonial leaders formed the basis of the treaty. The spoils were distributed, and the surviving Pequots were shared amongst them, enslaved among the English or adopted by the natives. They were forbidden to call themselves Pequots, or to return to land they had previously lived on. The English had now claimed it by right of conquest. The genocide of the Pequots was complete, or near as damn it. Notably, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was not party to this treaty, and since this meant that Connecticut suddenly gained claims over land that had previously been claimed by the Massachusetts Bay Colony, this caused a bit of a dispute. Carr makes a convincing comparison between the tactics used by the English in the Pequot War and the tactics, previously and in the future, to be used against the Irish. Against both enemies, the English employed terror tactics. Collective punishment, indiscriminate killing of populations, burning crops, and causing starvation. In the eyes of English commanders, in Ireland and New England, the enemy were barbarians, they were heathens, and they were rebellious. That final point may need some clarification. The Irish were rebellious because they were disloyal to their monarch. The Pequots, because Massachusetts had essentially demanded their fealty during Endicott's expedition and been rebuffed. The Pequots had been ravaged by disease and war, and so lost the right to be considered a sovereign people in English eyes. In 1634, their envoys had been called ambassadors and treated as dignitaries, their sachem styled as a king. Within a few years, their fall from grace, their hostility to their neighbours, and their resistance to conversion by the Puritans, made them insolent and barbaric subjects. As Carr puts it, quote, In the eyes of Puritan leaders, the Pequots, whatever their legal status, had become virtual subjects. And in dealing with lawless subjects, European military tradition was clear. Whatever force necessary to compel absolute submission was justified, including the utter destruction of the foe. Entire populations were legitimate military targets. The Pequots were doubly damned as both infidels and rebels. The Pequot War would have long-term consequences. Uncas would keep Mason as a friend for the rest of their lives, their bond forged in battle, and the English captain repeatedly defended the Mohegan sachem against other natives, as well as his fellow colonists. The war firmly reinforced English colonies in New England, opened up new territory for settlement, and the region would be in relative peace for decades. When war eventually broke out again, the legacy of the Pequot War would rear its ugly head. With our focus on events in New England over the last few episodes, I've ignored the settlement of other English colonies which progressed throughout the 1630s. It's important to remember, though, that subjects of Charles's other two kingdoms, as well as Wales, made up a significant minority of settlers in the burgeoning English Atlantic world. There were many barriers to their involvement, but they were present, and as we'll see next season, they were just as interested in events back home as any English colonist. I've touched on the islands of Montserrat, Antigua and Barbados a few months ago. These islands were covered under the charter awarded to Thomas Warner, which retroactively legitimised his settlement of the island of St. Christopher, or St. Kitts. Montserrat was unique in the burgeoning English West Indies in that it was predominantly Irish. The initial colonists were mostly Irish, former residents of St. Kitts, and encouraged to migrate by Warner in 1632. Irish settlers also made up the first wave of settlers to Antigua, though they would not have the same presence as here in Montserrat. In Montserrat, they were joined by Irish colonists from other settlements, like Virginia, as well as by voluntary and involuntary indentured servants from Ireland. Montserrat would be colonised largely by the Irish. English Protestants kept hold of many of the levers of power, but they did so through collaboration with Irish Protestant and Catholic planters. And for the next 40 years, 
the governor of Montserrat would either be Irish-born or a second-generation Irishman. Barbados had been settled in 1627. When the English arrived, the island was deserted. This was unlike most of the other English colonies in the Caribbean. We've already seen how the colonists in St. Kitts dealt with the native Kalanago, and similar difficulties would hinder the other colonies of the English West Indies. Not so in Barbados. There had been an indigenous population in previous decades, but it's likely that the relentless Spanish slave raids, seeking labour for their mainland mines and plantations, drove any survivors to more defensible islands, like the Windwards. So, when the English arrived in February 1627, on the orders of Sir William Courtine, they faced no resistance. No resistance from indigenous people, perhaps, but they faced plenty of bureaucratic obstacles. If you recall when we covered St. Kitts, there were competing claims to a number of the islands in the West Indies, St. Kitts and Barbados included. Charles issued letters patent to James Hay, 1st Earl of Carlisle, but then a few weeks or months later issued similar charters to the Earl of Pembroke, before the king reissued the patent to Carlisle in April 1628. Over that year, the representatives of the two earls fought over political control of Barbados in a three-way struggle with the agents of Courtine, who appears not to have any official claim to settle the island. Courtine's faction remained in control over that year, playing the two earls off against each other, but Charles's reissue in favour of Carlisle settled the matter. Carlisle, in collaboration with a group of London merchants, dispatched Charles Wolverston to be their governor of the island. He arrived in Barbados in June 1628, and within two months he had enforced his authority over the other factions on the island, and was named governor on the 4th of September. Now Governor Wolverston implemented a system of 12 justices of the peace to cover the island, and excluded the Courtine faction from political office. Through these measures, Barbados was judged wholly under the Earl of Carlisle's jurisdiction by the end of 1628. But this was not the end of Carlisle's problems with his new colony. One legacy of Courtine's rule was the land system. Colonists were not permitted to own any land. They were to farm the land, hand over the crops to the colonial government, and receive a wage of £100 a year. Now, for the men with money to spend, this was not acceptable. Land was, after all, the true measure of wealth and status, and they were being, in their view, unjustly blocked from buying any. Wolverston was accused of keeping this system in place, and so the disgruntled gentleman executed a coup d'etat against him. Wolverston was deposed and packed onto a boat back to England. This state of affairs was short-lived, however, as Carlisle then dispatched another governor with the backing of the king, and his rule was restored. The governor was Sir William Tufton, though you don't need to remember his name, he won't be lasting long either. Tufton arrived and immediately began restoring a Carlisle loyalist administration, dividing Barbados into six parishes, but notably not appointing an advisory council of wealthy colonists. Tufton was heavily criticised in petitions to Carlisle for being an autocrat and a tyrant. What form did this tyranny come in? Well, in the words of Professor Hilary Beckles, in his great book, A History of Barbados, From Amerindian Settlement to Caribbean Single Market, he was described as favouring the poor and being insensitive to the interests of the island's elite. His attempts to ameliorate the working conditions of white indentured servants added to his unpopularity among planters. With such criticisms of his governor, Carlyle had little choice but to recall him. In his place, Carlyle dispatched yet another replacement, the third in as many years. Henry Hawley arrived in Barbados in June 1629 and faced down Tufton, who was not taking his sacking well. Tufton resisted, presumably violently and presumably poorly, 
because he was defeated and executed for sedition. Hawley ruthlessly imposed his authority on the island. He didn't repeat the mistakes of his predecessors, appointing a council of twelve prominent colonists to advise him, and dispensing with the Courtine land system. Land was dispensed to colonists who had the resources to manage it, and this had consequences for Barbados's social order. Again from Beckles, quote, Each planter was to provide his own capital and labour, and pursue an independent agricultural policy. Carlyle's system of land tenure made it difficult for colonists without access to large sums of capital to become substantial landholders. By the early 1630s, then, political and economic conditions were established for the development of a society dominated by a small landed elite. The governor, embodying the rights of the proprietor Carlyle and his appointed council, were the sole body of judicial, legislative and executive authority in Barbados. The chief qualification for this council, aside from being the right sort, was loyalty to the governor. Who was the right sort? Well, obviously indentured servants are out. Enslaved Africans and Indians, certainly. Free Africans and Indians too, you can't be too careful. White wage labourers, also NQOCD. Essentially, to be considered for political office under Hawley, you had to be a white gentleman with substantial land holdings, the right connections in education, and unquestioning loyalty to Hawley. Under Hawley, this form of government was one of arbitrary and unappealable rule. Opponents of the governor had their land revoked and granted to Hawley's allies. Ignorance of the law was used to punish those who had fallen afoul of it without knowing. There was certainly nothing like the constitutional documents that would come out of New England over the next decade. The governor's word was law. Support for this podcast comes from Redbubble. Everyone's got a thing. Maybe you love dinosaurs, or you're obsessed with donuts, or you live and breathe super weird true crime shows. This is who you are, and if you want to express it, you should come to Redbubble. Redbubble is a marketplace with thousands of artists from around the world who are into dinosaurs, donuts, and true crime shows too. And they sell t-shirts, stickers, masks, pillows, posters, and more featuring original designs that celebrate them. So, you'll find stuff that you can trust will be perfect, because it's the thing you love made by an artist who loves it too. Redbubble.com. Find your thing, pay an artist. And so it was for the next six years, until the Earl of Carlisle approached his death and began to set his affairs in order. Barbados was placed in trust to settle his debts. Sir James Hay, member of Carlisle's family and agent for those trustees, arrived on the island in September 1636, and Hawley departed soon after, leaving his brother William in charge as acting governor. And yet again, not even a decade after the issue was last settled, the ownership of Barbados came into dispute. The Earl of Warwick, Robert Rich, made an offer to buy the island from Carlisle and the trustees. Carlisle, now dead and buried and replaced by the second Earl of Carlisle, his son James, was in favour of this sale, but the trustees were not, and they refused Warwick's offer. Warwick did not take no for an answer, and he dispatched his own agent, James Futter, to Barbados to start winning hearts and minds. Futter spread the word that, if Warwick owned Barbados, then he would institute something approaching representative government. The arbitrary rule of the governor, without any way to air their grievances, would be over. Unsurprisingly, this was quite a popular proposal, and over the next few years, Futter would win the majority of Barbados landowners to Warwick's side. When the trustees were informed of this turn of events in 1639, they again refused to sell to Warwick, and instead began working against the Hawley administration. Governor Hawley was still absent in England, but his policies were being followed by his brother, and the trustees believed that it was opposition to Hawley, rather than love for Warwick, that was pushing the planters to his side. If they removed him, they could keep control of the island. 
and so they appointed Sergeant Major Henry Hunks as governor and warned him that Hawley would surely contest his removal. Indeed, Hawley did, arriving back on the island in May 1639, and he immediately issued a proclamation promising elections for a general assembly, with any planter owning ten acres or more granted the franchise. This would include more than 1,500 men, and was enough to draw up support for Hawley's restoration. A small army behind him, Hawley deposed Hunks and began paying lip service to the promises he had made. The assembly did meet, but they had no power, and Hawley continued to rule as he had done, even more brazen in his authority than ever. By this point, Thomas Warner had been made Lieutenant General of all of Carlisle's colonies, including Barbados, but Hawley refused Warner's command to provide troops for an expedition into the Antilles. Possibly due to his domestic unpopularity, but there was little resistance when the second Earl of Carlisle dispatched a commission to arrest Hawley, confiscate his land, and reinstate Hunks. Hawley was taken back to England as a prisoner. The game of gubernatorial musical chairs continued as Hunks was replaced in 1631 by Philip Bell, and under Bell's rule, the Assembly finally attained something approaching legislative power. So this is the political context of early Barbados colonisation, and it's very interesting, but it was in economic terms that Barbados punched above its weight and became exceptional. The concentration of land into relatively few hands led to a concentration of wealth that could, and was, invested back into the land. They invested into new machinery, new lands, new goods, and perhaps most importantly, new labour to work them. We'll return to labour in a moment. That the planters were investing in their own land made it more attractive for investors back in England, as well as the Netherlands, to get involved and so the cycle continued. They were also prepared to switch what they farmed as the markets demanded. After settlement in 1627, the primary crop was, what else, tobacco. Over the next year, planters in Barbados and St. Kitts exported over £100,000 in weight of tobacco, sold at nine pence a pound. As you might expect, Every colony from St. Kitts to Virginia growing tobacco made it a buyer's market, and in August 1631, the price of tobacco plummeted. In response to this, the Virginian government instituted controls on crop harvests and fixed export prices, and the government back in England imposed bans and similar controls on the other colonies to attempt to aid Virginia. Both St. Kitts and Barbados were singled out in a Privy Council decree and ordered to limit their planting of tobacco. Instead, they should broaden their crop range into more staple goods. Unsurprisingly, the Barbadians ignored this decree. They argued that they were being discriminated against by a government dominated by Virginian lobbyists, who, after all, had been in place for decades. They continued to grow tobacco as they already had been, and by the end of the decade their tobacco exports would be growing, while those of St. Kitts and Virginia were falling. All of this took place while the Barbadians were ignoring the elephant in the room. Their tobacco was just awful, and everyone knew it. The Barbadians actually imported tobacco from Virginia rather than smoke their own, So despite continuing to grow tobacco in violation of London, the planters did diversify their produce. Cotton was one such staple, and by 1635, many of the largest landowners were dominating the industry, but the colonial government encouraged any and all landowners to grow the crop. Unlike their tobacco, Barbados cotton was prized back in Europe, and by the end of the decade it was cotton, not tobacco, that gave Barbados another economic boom. The good times were a-rolling, and then the good times rolled straight into a ditch. Once again, the supply of cotton was overwhelming demand, and prices plummeted. By 1641, the price of cotton had fallen by half of its 1635 value, and it collapsed so suddenly that many planters were ruined. For the planters that had weathered the economic storm, 
it was time to try and find a new cash crop, and we will cover this in a future episode. But now it's time to talk about labour. While the lack of indigenous people meant that the settlers had an easier start than their neighbours, it was something of a downside once the plantations began springing up across the island. In the Spanish and other English colonies in the Caribbean, native populations were a ready source of enslaved labour, as we've seen. While always on the lookout for bargains on enslaved Amerindians and Africans, the planter elite of Barbados intended to rely on that great export of the British Isles, people. More than half of the European settlers of Barbados arrived as indentured servants. We've seen this before in many other colonies, and the same rules applied here. Young adults were usually indentured for seven years, older adults for five. Their passage and supplies were paid for by their employer, and they worked off this debt in his service. It cost about five to six pounds to bring a servant from England, and about ten pounds a year to keep them fed, clothed, and sheltered. It was a worthwhile investment for the planters, and Beckles makes the point that the early Barbadian economy absolutely relied on a steady source of indentured labour. Life as an indentured servant was gruelling. In their contracts, the mostly voluntary servants were given several rights, such as the right to petition a magistrate if their master was overly cruel or abusive. Unfortunately for the indentured, it was their masters and their ilk that made up every authority in Barbados. As you might expect, it was rare for them to find in the indentured servants' favour, and these quote-unquote false allegations were often punished with floggings and other penalties. In these circumstances, it isn't surprising that there were insurrections amongst the servants in 1634 and later in 1647, but they didn't succeed. As harsh as their treatment could be and was, it bears repeating that this was not slavery. Their contracts could and were extended as punishment. Many died from illness or maltreatment before their contract was over, but indentured servitude wasn't meant to be for life. Likewise, the children of indentured servants did not share their parents' status and were born free. This was not the case for Africans or Amerindians in Barbados. The first enslaved Africans in Barbados arrived in 1627, the same year as the colony began. To quote Beckles again, This is very significant in that it sets out clearly a common moment of arrival and the establishment of the slave-based society at the inception of colonialism. Nevertheless, the numbers of enslaved blacks remained small for the next two decades. Indentured white labour was cheaper and more easily available. The first Amerindians arrived in 1627 as well, though they were not enslaved. It was agreed that these 32 Indians would live as free people, to teach the English how to farm in the tropical climate, and to teach them more about the new world. This state of affairs lasted, oh, about a year. With Carlyle's ascendancy over the other factions, this agreement was revoked, and the Indians were enslaved. In 1629, the total non-white population was at around 50, and a mixture of Africans and Amerindians. None were free. In 1636, Governor Hawley issued a decree that all blacks and Amerindians that arrived in Barbados were to be automatically considered enslaved for life, unless by prior agreement. This status carried over to their children. Enslaved blacks tended to work in the fields, while enslaved Amerindians were usually fishing or house slaves, depending on whether they were male or female. Amerindians sometimes received special privileges, the result of the English seeing them as more European than Africans. Some Indians were imported under terms of indenture, and presumably these contracts were kept to. According to Beckles, there are no records of similar contracts for blacks. Enslavement for life was the order from the very beginning of the colony. When we return to Barbados, enslaved blacks will be rapidly becoming the majority of the population, and over the rest of the century, the interplay between landowner whites, enslaved blacks and Amerindians, and Kalinago resistance across the Caribbean 
will take up more of the narrative. We'll finish off today by crossing back over the Atlantic. Massachusetts had been out of sight of London, but it was certainly not out of mind. In 1634, a committee of the Privy Council was established to investigate the Massachusetts Bay Colony. This was the brainchild of multiple parties with interests in the region, including Ferdinando Gorges and Thomas Morton. Gorges, we've seen before, he played key roles in several colonisation schemes throughout the reigns of James and Charles, and in the 1620s, he, along with several other associates, had established the Council for New England to distribute and administer a large stretch of territory from modern Philadelphia to Newfoundland. Thomas Morton was the troublemaker who had been chased out of the New World by the Plymouth Pilgrims. He'd since taken up the pen and published against the actions of the Puritans in New England, roundly criticising their behaviour towards the indigenous peoples as well as well as their heretical religious leanings. If you're interested in hearing more about Morton, the podcast Tides of History had an interview in January 2020 with Peter Mankell, who wrote a book all about him. It was when listening to that that I realised I'd sold Morton horrifyingly short. He's a fascinating character, so go check that out if you want to know more. Anyway, the Privy Council, under the direction of Archbishop Lord, and at the instigation of Gorges and Morton and others with axes to grind, began to look into what the colony was doing. The first thing to do was to have a read of the colonial charter and see exactly what the conditions of the colony had been. This was the point when the Privy Council discovered they didn't have it. No one in England had the charter. Winthrop had taken it with him, and he wasn't meant to do that. So this Privy Council committee began legal proceedings to dissolve the Massachusetts Bay Company, and by summer 1637, the case was closed. Charles declared that the Council of New England would be dissolved, and the various colonies would be governed in the same manner as Virginia, as crown colonies, with the governor appointed by the king. The first governor would be Ferdinando Gorges. Except that didn't happen. The ship which was to take Gorges and his council to their new jurisdiction was crippled as soon as it was launched, and this was just the latest in a line of financial disasters for Gorges. He was almost bankrupt, and he simply didn't have the resources to enforce the judgment of the Privy Council. In 1639, he did receive a royal charter for Maine, and sent a cousin to act as deputy governor while he settled his affairs in England. But, as we know, the domestic situation in the British Isles would rapidly deteriorate, and Gorges would decide to stay and fight for his king at the ripe old age of 74. And that is how we will end off this episode, and this season of Pax Britannica. Thank you to everyone who has listened over the last 40-odd episodes. It really is crazy to think that it's been more of a year of making this podcast. Thank you to everyone who has supported the podcast and myself, either through Patreon or indirectly through sharing the podcast with a friend or on social media. It's a bit of an understatement to say that my plans have been ever so slightly disrupted by this global pandemic, and obviously there are millions of people in the same boat. I'm fine, I don't want to give the impression that I'm not, but it's possible that in the not-so-distant future this podcast will become a vital part of my income. That's just a long-winded way to say that I really appreciate every penny and every new listener that comes my way. Next time, we will begin the new season on the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. I am very excited to get stuck into this. I remember learning about it in school, and since then I've listened to Mike Duncan talk about it, and I've just been so excited to cover it myself. It's going to be a lot of fun, it's going to be very interesting, and I'm so glad to be in the position to actually do this. Thank you to the King's favourite, Andrew Shoemaker, the Royal Headsman, executed today, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin, the Duke of Ormond, Brendan Bonner, the Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer, the Marquess of Hereford, Christopher Remo, the Marquess of Queensbury, Brent Sitz. Joining their ranks is Lord Kyle, the Viscount Lindemann, and Lord Elijah, Baron Lace Adams. <laughs>
As always, you can join their ranks and receive an ad-free RSS feed by going to patreon.com slash hexbritannica. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening to this season of Pax Britannica.